Hello, I am Jess from Prototype and I am here today talking to Paul Buck, the author of Along the River Run, um, which is the latest novel in the Prototype fiction series. Um, it's a crime novel uh, of sorts set in Lisbon and tells the story of two London lads um, who have escaped to the city. Um, and it's about the strange things that happen to them as they come to terms with a crime they've committed. Um, there's much more to it than that, but that's a brief um, summary to set out this conversation. Um, we're both at home, of course. We're still in lockdown. Paul is not, in fact, in Lisbon. Um, so to start with, Paul, can you tell us a bit about when and why you wrote this novel? It's something that I read a few years ago, actually, and that we've been working on gradually um, over time. And um, so tell us a bit about the background. Right. Well, it's a very simple seed that started the book. For example, when we see something on the news or read in the paper, either a murder, a crime, or even a political point that comes out, we immediately make a judgment, depending on our background, our, what influences us. We, we make some form of judgment. And then later on, perhaps, let's say, if it, particularly if it was a murder, and the trial comes up, we then start to read about other details, more context. And so therefore, we might suddenly have an understanding of what really went on, or empathy for the characters or not but certainly it changes our judgment so i wanted to take a very straightforward event which happened in the north of england more than a decade ago where a murder was committed and the two people that did it they fled the country so i went with that idea as a starting point but of course there were issues that made me want to continue. What really interested me was not, I'm not interested in the police chasing them. I'm interested in what happened to these two people when they're taken out of their context. Suddenly they have another world which they cannot relate to. <clears throat> and their upbringing doesn't really allow them to adjust to it. So they have to come to terms. They have no option. They're between the age of 15 and 25 when things change in your life. And suddenly, it's like if you are put in prison, you suddenly realise you can start to become educated. It's a similar situation. It's a different prison. You're in Lisbon and you suddenly could become educated or things can happen to you. We're living in the moment in a lockdown and a lot of people, it is affecting them mentally. So it's a similar situations that we have now. People are thrown into places where they have to come to terms with where they are or not, risk the consequences. So that's where we're coming from in this book. What also I thought was very important was that the very first scene, the prologue, so to speak, is very, very heavy. It will put off a lot of people. It is supposed to nauseate you. I know we see it in films nowadays. You get a horror film, uh, or not even a horror film, a crime film, crime television series, where the introduction is extremely heavy. But it's heavy and not heavy. This is heavy, and with words, you can actually make things happen that the reader doesn't really realise they've taken in. So on, on the surface, it, it looks heavy or not heavy. But actually, you've actually the skill is to try to make it heavier for the reader. With the consequence, then you then take on board and judge in these characters from that point of view. <clears throat> and then, as the book goes on, you have to take on board that image that you have at the beginning, and to compare everything that happens to them against that image. And to think of it in terms of film, for example. In the olden days, Hollywood characters, Hollywood stars used to say, I have to be seen from this angle. I have to have this lighting on me so that the audience sees me as this type of character. You know, my reputation is this. I want this. So that's how they used to be. 
And then later on, some of them thought, I'm very famous. It doesn't really matter. This, this film is just an ordinary Hollywood film. Let's make it more challenging for myself. Let's ask them to make sure that I'm shown in a very bad light at the beginning, because then people will see me like that. And then I have to spend all the film trying to prove to them that really I'm not that bad a character. And their first opinion of me was wrong. And it's a similar type of thing here, what I'm trying to do. And so make it very, very heavy. But you have to go over that. And it gives you that thing to bounce against all the time. Everything that happens in the book, you bounce against that. Not always consciously, of course, but that is what, to me, was the challenge. The book isn't just about writing a story for me. It's just about using language. Yeah. You mentioned that opening because it's it is quite it's it's violent and shocking um, and it is something that that we discussed because it as a as a publisher I suppose you think what what are people going to you know ha- well like you said will people be put off, put off and afraid to read on and just appalled by these characters and of course um, any nerves I had about that there's a, there's a good reason for them and you we we discussed that and. Um, that constant image in your head. It's, a, it's an image that you can't erase. Um, and that's, of course, its power and its reason for and being there. It's also relevant today because of the position of sexual assault on women and men as well, but sexual assault on women. It is a, an issue that is current and also brings up the point of the way I use women within the book. I don't use women. Women are the the book. To me, women are the book, not not the two main characters. Um, they are the thing that's in the center, but it's the way their reaction and relationship with the women that is the important thing for me. This is one of the other areas interested me as I wrote it. One of the other reasons why I wrote it. Um, and. Why is the novel set in Lisbon um, and, and what is your your interest with the city? You wrote an earlier cultural guide to the city, um, which is a brilliant book and I highly recommend it to everyone. Um, but what's, what's your relationship with Lisbon um, and why did this story feel like it needed to be set there? Lisbon is one of those cities which I fell in love with and the first time I went, Catherine had been there before and she told me various things. And I was reading Pessoa, Saramago, various, when I saw the film, Alan Tanner's In the White City. Um, I mean, people have this idea that the White City is a a Portuguese kind of concept, but it's not, it's from Alan Tanner's film. If you stand on the other side of Lisbon, the other side of the river, and look across, it's a very white city. And, the term was actually came from him, from his title of the film, but also the sun coming down very hard on the stones makes it bounce and reflect. It makes the city very, very white and very, very bright. And those kind of ideas were there in my head before we went. And first time and the second time. And then we just keep going because although it's a small city, there's still a lot there and you don't actually get bored with it. If it's too big, then you'd never be able to explore. You can actually walk around this city, although the metro system, the new part is brilliant, but you actually want to walk around. And also the river is very important part of this. Um, I think we really get that sense reading the book of a deep knowledge and understanding of the city and its inheritance and also this the strangeness, the kind of magical quality of it through the eyes of these young guys, one of whom's never even travelled abroad before. Um, of course, central to both the city and to the book um, is the river. The book's cover, we've got um, an image of a, a cork with the word Tagus written across it, um, which really makes sure that everybody knows before even, in, even opening the book that this, the river is, is central um, and the imagery of a river, um, it keeps appearing throughout the book. Um, can you talk a little bit more about that, how the image of the river works its way through the book, both literally and as a kind of image and metaphor? 
without giving you any spoilers, because I'm always told I give spoilers when I'm talking about things. Along the River Run itself is taken from James Joyce. And very particularly, I wanted that kind of concept to flow the rhythm of it, the music of it, within the language as well as in the actual physical side of it. <clears throat> Lisbon is set beside the river. It's a very wide river to take us. And it's on the, just coming up to the estuary. So it's like the Thames going into the, in, into the channel. So it widens even further. So the book starts with this crime committed by a very small river in London, southeast London. They flee to somewhere which they didn't know about, which is actually by a very wide river. And so therefore I want that kind of implications of, of that. And there's bridges across it. You play with the ideas there. The concept of swimming is part of the book in various ways. And even fishing, because they see people fishing there, but that also has echoes through. So I play with all those echoes of that, but also the concept of water. I use water itself in many different ways. Um, sometimes you don't even notice it, but I want it to kind of seep in, so to speak. Um, so you feel like you're floating on it. Um, and a lot of the a lot of the references, the cultural references, the writers, the filmmakers, the painters, their use of water and the Tagus as well is there without you necessarily realising it. But to me, the whole point is on any book or on anything I, that one writes or any art, as far as I'm concerned, I want to know all the undercurrents. Whether you appreciate them or not, it doesn't matter because the more levels, the more you understand. Sometimes it's just one sentence in the course of it. In the, in the prologue, there's a few sentences that are put in there, which you'll probably read straight over. But later on, you will suddenly think, ah, now I understand something about that character. Because I want, and quite a lot of them relate to concepts of the river and the water, because I want that there. And I want the concept of flow and the concept of the, the music of a river. To me, this is what is important to flow. A sense of music and rhythm is one of the important things for me in life. The pulse of the body. Yeah. Yeah. And are there writers in particular whose, whose styles, whose interests, um, whose ways of storytelling um, were particularly kind of con consciously bring their, make their way into the book. Um, is, this, is that something you can tell us a bit about, the kind of literary influences, I suppose, or not, not just literary, um, cultural, um, as, as a city you know so well and have written a cultural guide to. Um, can you talk a bit about any writers or artists or music even that's, that's brought its way, found its way into the book? From a, a Portuguese point of view, there were three writers, actually there's more than three, but three main writers who have embedded, or in fact haunt the city, so to speak. I'm in the foreground, and behind me is the image of Lisbon. It is actually fake, it is actually projected, and I am the real, the real body here. But it appears as if I'm the one who's haunting the image, and that is real, and I am one because I move in and out or aspects of you, it is one of the good things or bad things, whichever way you look at it. But that kind of concept of haunting is one of the things that the book is also about. It is a haunting of people. It doesn't matter. It, it's haunting as a reality in the book, the characters and what happens. But also the town, the city is haunted by Pessoa, Saramago, and I actually referenced another one, Sarcanero on, on the jacket. He died very young at the age of 26. He committed suicide in Paris, but he was an intimate of Pessoa. Pessoa is also a haunting character, not only because he writes about Lisbon, particularly in the Book of Disquiet, which is his big famous book, but he had over 80 heteronyms, which are like pseudonyms. 
wrote under all these different names. So some of them are there when you and you don't even realize you're reading a book by Pessoa. And so they're kind of a haunting image on Portuguese literature on Lisbon itself. And Saramago in his term has also taken on Pessoa. One of his books called, um, I'm trying to think, The Year of the Death of Ricardo Rez. Ricardo Rez is one of the, the names, the heteronyms of Pessoa. And so he's writing as a character coming back to Lisbon to meet up with, with Pessoa under this other name. So we're talking already haunting images there. And so the, but they talk about real places and you feel it's the skill of being able to write without kind of just naming this road, that road and all the rest of it. So you feel where they're going, which areas they're in. And that Saramago one in Ricardo Rez is part of the area where my book is set in. <clears throat> but he wrote another one up near the castle as well, which I also reference quite a bit. I mean, I use quite a bit of them, um, but mainly down towards the river and down towards the Docklands, going right the way through to Kashkaish, which is like the Margate of, not very nice, of the Margate of Lisbon is Kashkaish, next to Esteril, which is where the famous casino where James Bond was first thought about and all the rest of it. Um, and like these kind of things are kind of played with in the book as well, referenced. So they are the, some of the literary type of characters, but of course, from another point of view, my influence of people who influenced me is just tremendous. So I would just, just say the Portuguese ones at this particular point there. Yeah. Um, you've already <coughs> mentioned um, a little bit about the way you think about writing dialogue, um, the musicality of it. Um, you've written a lot for the theatre um, and are an expert really on, on writers like Arto Beckett. Um, dialogue is obviously, I mean, what you can tell from reading this book and with just a small knowledge of your other work that dialogue, speech, the sounds of language are incredibly important to your writing. Um, could you talk a bit more about that and about how you capture the particular voices of these, of the characters in this, in this book? Because it's a very particular kind of way of, of speaking, which with all of the kind of signifiers of class and education that comes with it. Um, could you talk a bit more about that? It's very interesting because last night I was thinking about Sexy Beast, the film, and you have a dialogue in the middle between Ray Winston and Ben Kingsley, where they don't have much vocabulary, <laughs> is one way of putting it, and yet you can tell the two different characters. Mm -hmm. yeah words it's the way they do it but of course you can't do that on the page you've got to find other ways writing for theater dialogue for theater writing dialogue for film writing dialogue on the page are different mm -hmm. and yet one doesn't want to clip all the words one wants to find ways of of organizing the sentence slipping words differently or just yes yeah, slight nuances in either character so you can tell which character is talking particularly as i don't want to write he said you know jake said lee said you want it to run. I come from a background of the 60s, Harold Pinter. In fact, I'm sitting in Sig Cup now, which is where Pinter's caretaker kept his papers, which is where all my papers are. So, but for me, though I like Pinter overall, the early Pinter with the menace of the two characters and how you make those characters work against each other is very important to me. You could see the same in Beckett, if we suddenly mention Beckett, of the tramps. You know, that stand-up routine of them playing off against each other. And in Beckett's case, he was often interested in the sound rather than the sense. He often used to tell the actors, you know, Billy Whitelaw or whoever, go with the sound, not the sense. And to me, it is the same because when people speak, they misspeak and it, you mishear people, you hear sounds rather than sense. And so how to play with all this? That, that was one of the challenges for me. And I wanted to really focus on dialogue, not only coming out of theatre, but 
crime writers like Horace McCoy, Harry Whittington, who are the kind of fifth noir writers, but a bit more than that, they're social writers as well. They're not interested really in private detectives, police procedures. <clears throat> they're interested in the social background of the crime that's going on or the criminal aspect. Um, but they can write lots of dialogue and you understand what's happening, how to play with that. I mean, most people know Horace McCoy because of they shoot horses, don't they? But in fact, I should have stayed at home, which is set in Hollywood, is to me the one that plays with the dialogue. It taught me a lot about dialogue, how to make dialogue work. Harry Whittington does the same. Not famous, because, you know, these kind of writers like Jim Thompson, David Goodis, Day Keane, they're much more well known as these pop writers. But Harry Whittington is another one. It's long spans of just dialogue and you get taken along. That's one of the challenges. And in one of the parts, I think it's about 10 pages or something like that, which is just dialogue with three people. I might try and record it in the next few days and see whether I can do it. So it's three people, so I have to also play a Portuguese person at the same time, transgender person as well. So mm. that's where dialogue is for me. It is theatre, but the difference between, if I was to make this novel into a film script, I'd have to lose lots of the dialogue yeah. because visually you can capture it. But here on the page, you have to take it without putting too much extra in, how can you make the dialogue do it? To me, that's one of the challenges. Mm -hmm. And I would like people to roll with that as well and then realise where they've gone and how suddenly things become a shock to them just through the dialogue. And you've not actually said anything more than what's in the dialogue. Yeah. yeah. Anyway. Yes. Um, think, thinking a bit more about um, traditions of crime write, writing of noir, um, as you've started to talk a little bit about. Um, there's been a high profile for crime writing in France with Série Noir, for example. Would you place Along the River Run in a similar field? Um, I'm asking really because your writing and your work as a translator, editor, publisher is very much rooted in French culture. Um, so can you Tell us a little bit about these influences and connections in your work and life. I mean, it's you know you've, you're somebody who's been incredibly important in publishing the work of French writers for English readerships as well. Um, so this could be a, a huge conversation about many different things. But I suppose thinking specifically yeah. about um, the traditions that play into this book. If we were to take the Serial Noirs, you just said, so that started in the mid '40s. They were basically interested in the American noir writers like Jim Thompson, David Goodis, um, Horace McCoy, James M. Cain, very particularly. And unlike at that time in England, it influenced a lot of French writers. Camus were influenced by Horace McCoy and James M. Cain. And they acknowledged the fact, uh, I don't want to go into the all reasons why but that and for me I wrote a book in the 60s called The Honeymoon Killers and Sir Noir bought it so it was published in France very soon after that I became friends with a French crime writer called Manchette who's now regarded as the leading kind of contemporary crime writer he died too young we were good friends um what he, li what he liked in our friendships, he saw I was literary, and yet he had chosen crime writing as a literary way because he didn't really want to follow the Telcal people or, or the, or the Nouveau Roman. He thought he could do social political things within crime writing. And he knew that I was interested in that and I was not interested in police procedure. But at the same time, I had a literary interest, but he could see that I was interested in language and he was interested in how you could play language. So that was our relationship. <clears throat> and although all his novels became films, um, we actually started writing a novel together because he had a block at one point. And I said, oh, let's write a novel together. 
So it's slightly out of that field on purpose. And we, we got about eight chapters in, then he suddenly was back in again. So his last novels before he died, um, I was kind of doing some research from him in this country. And in France just now, there's been a big book of a big thick book of his letters just come out. Well, they're only a selection. But up to my shock and surprise, I noticed the 12 letters from me in there. It was James Elroy, D Donald Westlake, you know, all these people that he was also communicating with. Uh, but in fact, I, that's because he was trying to bait me. I say it like that bait me into writing another crime book to write in that area and so he was testing me by trying to say these are the things which we have to play with this is the concept what makes a crime book work go on and i'm challenging you to kind of do that so we were talking about the mechanics of crime writing so it made him articulate and he kept copies of all his letters as well so it made us both we're both interested in the mechanics of things so that was part of it <clears throat> so, in the crime writing area, it's the American French manchette that I'm involved with. But of course, outside that, as you just suggested, my involvement in French literature very directly is actually post Nouveau Roman with people like the Telcal writers or Charles writers, Jean Pierre Fay and others, who are Behind them is George Bataille, Maurice Blanchot, Pierre Klosowski, Arto, Pierre Guillotard, and they are kind of big people for me, plus a whole load of other people, poets and writers, and that is really where I'm coming from. And they pepper everything I do, even though I might hear at this particular moment writing a, cr a crime social novel, psychological thriller, it's still got all those undercurrents for me. It doesn't mean to say everyone's got a no, but that the more the more you have underneath and the more you understand, the more you can hone it and try to make something work on a simple level. The idea is to try to simplify, not to make things more complicated as you get older. I hope, I think that's what I'm to, yeah. to a degree. Yeah. But at the same time, all my work is playing with different areas. Yeah. Because I challenge myself in different ways. So mm -hmm. that's why I was challenging in this book. That's what I'm, and I would like, if it wasn't for the situation we're in, I was actually moving towards theatre and I wanted to write theatre again. I have a one woman play, which I wrote a long while ago. We've only ever partly staged. I could even do that now because it only requires one woman on stage. Um, it's like, Bataille meets Hans Belmer in the way it is one woman in a room. And it's not really thinking of Beckett at all. But as I say this, I'm thinking, oh, Beckett, but it's not. And yet at the same time, I would like to do, because I have directed, I would like to direct Jenna's The Screens, which is almost impossible. But that is the challenge. Because, you, and at this particular moment, impossible. You couldn't even think of stage in it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think Peter Brook and I think the Royal Shakespeare Company, Marat Saad. I mean, he could have gone that way and he, could, he did US, but Marat Saad is a kind of a good way when you're moving towards the screens. But to really, we haven't, we're distance enough from Genet to be able to do it differently. Distance enough from the Algerian war mm -hmm. to be able to do it, to take it on. But it will never happen. I'm too old and, uh, um, it's going to take a few years before the life settles down again and before theatre builds again. So I've yeah. discarded that. For now, for now. No. Um, something important about this book, um, and you said earlier that the women are at the heart of the book. They're crucial, um, even though the two main characters are these, these young men. Um, so women have a very important role to play in this book. Um, Hestia Pepe on the back of the, the book, we have a quote from her um, discussing your craft as a writer. And she says um, that the book is propelled and your work in general is propelled by the powerful currents of a lifelong engagement with the feminine. Um, tell us more. <laughs> in particular this book, but also in general, 
this house is full of books by women and has been ever since the 60s. Women have played a very important part in my reading. Um, whether it be, let's say, Marguerite Jura, whether it be Jane Bowles, you know, these are all before they were fashionable, Jean Rees, before anyone even knew their names. Even crime writers, you look downstairs on my shelves, Lee Brackett, Vim Packer, Dolores Hitchens, Dorothy Hughes, Helen Nielsen, oh, I can go on. Uh, Vim Packer, I must have virtually every single one of hers. Then they are gold medal books. They're kind of social novels, not crime in one sense, mm -hmm. but they're so novels. But these all have kind of filtered into me. You look at my the music shelves, I have an enormous number of, <laughs> when I go from Ella Fitzgerald, Karen Krog, uh, Sheila Jordan, you know, all these female singers, jazz singers, but it going further, I mean, just female singers, you know, mm -hmm. or female musicians, or, you know, Frances Maria Uti, who plays the cello, is one of my my great loves you know, as, a, as a cellist and what she tells me and what she teaches me in either writings or she's on my Facebook so I can see how as a person as well. Um, they're all part of what I'm about. So into the book here and because I was brought up in totally in a female environment, sister, mother, all the people living next door. So it doesn't mean to say I understand women, but they've become my challenging point. And so, yes, and I live, you know, I'm married and yeah, two daughters, a son from another relationship, but two daughters, very specifically. Um, and so I try to reflect in the course of this book, their different relationship with a different type of women. From the very word go, the very first people in the book are women, different type of character. And you then start to assume about them as well. And of course, you have to then judge them as you go on because there's still a presence in the book. As well as the people they meet in Lisbon, they can't help because they're out, they're out of their, their zone. How are they supposed to they meet people? They have to react to people. They're not in the high society areas. They're amongst the people on the street. They've got to meet with those people. They go into bars. They get thrown into situations. And so therefore, they're people who they don't normally meet. So I wanted to try and bring forward ideas of them. And Lisbon, and particularly at the time, which is the beginning of the millennium, it was one of those hot cities where people used to go for the weekend. Along the riverfront, there's all those clubs, nightclubs, looks and things like that, where transgender people or um, lots of camp people used to be dressing up. You could, you could see it all the time. As, uh, there's lots of articles written about it at the time as well. And it's there's still that aspect there of those bars. And I wanted to bring out part of that as well. But there's all the different facets of women I worked with in the book and to try to make them not just subsidiary, but to bring out the characterization of them all as well. So that you either feel for them. No one is black or white in the book. I don't want you to think everyone's a good. Nobody is black or white. I don't think. I can't place anyone. As well. Everyone yeah, has different facts. I facets. agree with that as a reader. <laughs> yeah, I mean, no one comes out of it well. I don't think. No, someone must. Particularly. <laughs> someone does. Perhaps, ah, oh, yes, there's a woman who's the clerk in the hotel towards the end. Yes, that's true. That's <laughs> true. She doesn't part, but she is sympathetic yeah. straight and understands what she can do. Yeah. Um, there's, yeah. So, there's so much that we could talk about and it feels like I wish we could explore so many different areas. But um, to finish, I thought it might be nice for people to just hear a bit about how you've got through these crazy months that we've all, well, that we're all still in. Um, the chaos of life at the moment um, and its strangeness. Um, what has this been making you want to write? And what are you working on at the moment? I know you're working on a few different things, but um, anything in particular that feels like it had to be done now because everything is just so strange. Already I have finished 
um, but I haven't come to terms with publishing it yet. It's a book that's set in Whitehall, White Hole, White Hell. It's all about the lies and the and the rapture of lies. It's extreme. It's like Sard meets Bataille meets Pierre Guillotin. And will I publish it? I don't know. Um, but I wrote it and I finished it. And I finished it before we've gone into this even worse stage on purpose. I wanted to finish it because now in my head, I want to win a, a, another existential period. And I feel that I should be sitting down and writing according to that as well. Years ago, I wrote The Honeymoon Killers in one week. I did one week's research, one week's writing. I had no choice. I was being commissioned to write it. So, but I did, and that's what Marchette picked up on when we became friends. <clears throat> Pulp fiction was written very fast, but I know people who write very fast now. I tend to not to. I've written a book without you, which is about Phil. It's a narrative based on 167 films, and I draw on all the narratives from them, make a novel. That took five years. But I would like to sit down now just to pull out all the plugs, not phone, Facebook, everything, and lock myself for two weeks and just write a book. It's not with a blank screen, blank paper. It is with what's inside of that tension that's there of what's around and to find something. Um, I'm thinking like that because I'm thinking of George Bataille. I'm thinking of Walter Benjamin. I'm thinking of Clarice Lispector. I'm thinking of... Maria Gabriela Lansol, who is a Portuguese writer that nobody knows. Uh, once again, another one of these, like Clarice Respect, until a while ago, nobody really knew. And has only really now been discovered in Portugal. She's been sitting on my desk there for a while. And now, you know, they're, all of them have got things which kind of make me understand that I can, could do something. But whether I... How it happens, I don't know. So I have an ongoing books all the time. They're always challenging concepts of what can be done and what can't be done with books. And that's, that's an ongoing thing. This is why I think of Bataille, who was always challenging ideas and never really finishing, never having closure. I mean, I've got 25 books which I've never published when I look at it. I mean, there either be novels, collection of essays, collection of poems, substantial, not just all my little pamphlets, um, novels, prose works, about 200 songs that I've written. Once again, it's another aspect of the music side, is exploring songs. I've written songs for people, whether it be Mark Ormond, who I translated Jacques Brel and others, or Full Shake Cameras or Melinda Miel. And what interested me there was what the rhythms, the, the rhythms within language, how to make them so that people could sing them or how you could vocalise them. That's all part of this concept of rhythms of language, flow, movement. Um, so, you know, and once again, there's about 200 of those. You could publish those as a book. So there's all these things, but I don't necessarily always see that you have to write a book to publish it. But now I'm starting to see that I've got a web and that perhaps I should fill in some of the gaps. I'm getting a bit old and... Uh, might be an idea to put a bit more cement in. Is that good? Oh, a bit more, let a bit more water flow over it all. Um, thank you so much, Paul. That's really brilliant. Um, and so much more to be found out. Um, 